Welcome to Sightlines. I'm Dr. Hunter Cherwick, Vice President of Clinical Services at Orbis International. Orbis is working to fight avoidable blindness and vision loss around the world. There are millions of people living without eyesight simply because they were born in places where they can't get the care they need for their eyes. And a striking thing about the vast number of people affected by global blindness is that most of them are women and girls. In fact, there are 139 million women and girls living with blindness around the world. That's 25 million more women than men. We are on a mission to eliminate avoidable blindness. And if we're gonna do that, it's clear that we must address this gender disparity head on. That's what we'll explore together on this episode of Sightlines, the gender disparity in global eye health, how to address it, the essential roles women play in this work, and how COVID is impacting and even leaving a legacy on all of it. I'm very happy to say that Bolgan Ordal Sagan is back as my Sightlines co-host today, and we're looking forward to taking a deeper dive into this important topic. We started by sitting down virtually, as always, with Julia Anderson, the CEO of CanWatch. CanWatch stands for the Canadian Partnership for Women and Children's Health. Here's our conversations with Julia. Julia, thank you so much for joining this episode uh, for Sightlines. Uh, we are very excited to have you with us. Can you tell us a little bit about more uh, uh, what CanWatch does and um, the mission and the collaborations you guys have? Yeah, happy to, and uh, thanks so much for having me. So CanWatch is a membership-based organization. So we've got over 100 members. They can be research institutions. They can be civil society organizations like yourself or NGOs. Um, and they can also be healthcare practitioner associations. So the Canadian Association of Midwives, for example, is one of our members, the nurses and, and the gynecologists and obstetricians. So they all come together under this collective banner to uh, improve the health rights of women and children and adolescents around the world. They're all actively working in that space. So they're Canadian organizations largely, but work um, uh, overseas uh, on development projects as well as often within Canada. Um, and really our focus as CanWatch is to increase their capacity to do that work, to make sure that we're focusing in on, I always say, it's like we're uh, standing there and there's a street light and it's our job to like pull the street light over and focus in on the issues that are going to have the most impact. And where we think their most impact is, is, is a focus on women and girls because they're often the most neglected. They're often the most le left behind. COVID has uncovered that this is true in so many deep ways. Um, and so we try to pull with all of our might without the collective will of our members, that spotlight uh, onto that issue and really excited to talk to you about it today. COVID has been affecting every uh, area and especially it's been disrupting global health system. And um, specifically, um, how do you think the implications on the woman and the girls, what we need to focus on in these days? You know, there's so many entry points. Can watch, we focus on health, so we focus on health rights, and there's so many entry points to think about um, when we're thinking about the COVID crisis and how it's disproportionately impacting women. So we see that women are the frontline healthcare workers. So they are globally the most impacted by contact with the disease. So they are there engaging in their communities with the sick, with folks who need help, with need, who need support. They're out and about from the going to market, going to the grocery store, doing the childcare, have the most points of contact. We also know that there's been this dramatic rise in Canada and around the globe in gender-based violence. So um, we've known for a long time that the place that is least safe for a woman to be is not out in the you know community on the streets it is in her home and that is true that has been true for a long time so what happens when you send people into isolation well that that reality is very stark for a lot of women and that's true to countries like Canada the United States and it's true to developing countries so we have this shared this shared challenge that we need to find new ways and think about when we're designing any types of healthcare interventions and we're, when we're talking about addressing COVID from newborn to childhood to young children not being in school through dramatic healthcare implications of a child not being in school. We see in my community here in uh, Peterborough, Ontario in Canada, um, 
the children who aren't going to school at my school are not accessing food because that's where they had their solid meal, their, their only solid meal of the day. That's true globally too, right? Where food, things like women and girls, sanitary napkins, you know, period products, these things were all the school was a hub for health care. So we think of hospitals as a hub for health care, but the school was really often a hub for health care. So at that stage and phase in life, you know, women are being disproportionately impacted. And then as you move into adolescence and girls who be, choose to become pregnant, we're seeing this global trend where with an economic downturn, we know that girls enter into marriage at younger ages. That's been true at different points of economic decline, which is happening again. So there's all these different kind of vantage points and entry points um, to where women and girls show up in this space. And you can see that progress made um, prior to COVID is going to take, if we're not careful, is going to take these dramatic steps back. We've been presented with the statistics that, um, you know, 25 million women or girls uh, suffer more than the boys when it comes to blindness or eye-related diseases. And I think this is a massive, massive statistic. And because they don't get the help, they're the last ones to go and get those help um, in the areas that we work. And there's certainly, as you mentioned, the disruptions in terms of not being able to go to school and there's missing out. What do you think that the learning lesson from, um, you know, after the pandemic is over that we, we were able to focus on this area or have solution on some of these um, issues? I mean, really, it's just this dogged commitment uh, to a focus on how our interventions create or perpetuate inequality. So I think the easiest story to wrap our mind around is that idea of isolation as a necessary tool, social distancing as a necessary tool to fight the pandemic, and a woman being forced into a home that's unsafe. That's really easy for women and girls all around the world and humans all around the world to wrap their heads around what that would mean, to feel like in order to not get sick, I have to do this, and I am afraid to do this because of uh, the consequence of me being at home. Um, so I think what success would be look what success would look like is that we've actually we're actually paying attention to this um, and watching for this and, and thinking about our interventions with those lenses. And I'm very interested to hear from you how your access has been impacted by COVID uh, when it comes to uh, interventions and uh, around blindness and seeing. That's a great question, Julie, and I think you hit on it before where the school has really been an area where we can provide all children with a specific focus in young girls, annual eye exams, spectacle distribution, and one of the things that I think you're also hitting on during these discussions is how everything's connected to everything else, how eyesight is connected to education, how that's related to economics, how that's related to equity, and those are metrics that we have in all of our programs, and certainly as we're ramping up and restoring services, those are vulnerable populations that we're targeting and making sure that we're addressing first. That is in schools, that is with the remote vision centers that we're having. I I think job creation, and that's something I'd love to hear your thoughts. Obviously, you're a subject matter expert in this, how we can use innovation and the restart and this new normal to do job creation and social enterprise specifically geared towards women in the vision space. That's something I'm personally very interested in and would love to hear your thoughts on. You know, when I travel, when I used to, to, used to travel, there's a tremendous number of critical healthcare workers. I am not talking about you know informal healthcare work is also critical but i'm actually talking about formal healthcare workers who have a role in the community i was in rwanda and i met these four women they all volunteered between i would say 8 and 16 hours a week uh, going from home to home every time babies were born, every time there was young children doing the nutritional test, doing checkups on things related to diarrhea, things related to, you know, those basic newborn interventions. These healthcare workers were the front line. They were giving out medicine. They were, they were well-trained. Um, and then I asked, well, what, what, what are you paid? Nothing. They were volunteers. It was an honor to be, to play this role within their community, they did it because it needed to be done and they wanted to see their neighbors and their neighbor's children survive and thrive. The countries who have made, and, and from a development, international development assistance perspective, if we could prioritize this, when we know that the majority of 
frontline healthcare workers, these women that I'm talking about, are women. And all we did was say, okay, rather than this being volunteer hours, we're going to pay you. And that would be in the cited, that would be around site. All kinds of healthcare interventions are taken care of in a, a community level by volunteers. Half a step back to say, let's pay them would be a game changer, like a global game changer. Um, so that would be my recommendation. No, I, I love that. And that's something definitely we're looking at and how we can make sure that we empower those who are on the front line, whether it's school teachers doing eye exams or people going into villages, identifying cataracts and doing community education and community mobilization work. One of the big things that we've seen during this pandemic, we have a telemedicine distance learning program called CyberSight. It's in 199 countries. We've had 30,000 registered users who are learners on a you know, weekly and daily basis, as well as 30,000 teleconsults. One of the biggest things I'd love to hear your thoughts is how we get all people across the digital divide. So that how do we democratize education through technology? How do we democratize access so that we don't have a barrier by trying to introduce technology? How do you see that as, as something that we as Orbis should have a responsibility as we look to deploy new technologies that we don't worsen divides or disparities, but actually close the gap with the technologies we're deploying? Yeah, this is a, a challenge that I've heard every time we have a technology conversation. And again, it's one of those um, challenges that's as true in uh, Canada as it is globally. Um, so it's a shared challenge that there is a technological and digital divide that means the most marginalized communities, if you think about rural or northern communities in our context, have the least access and the most marginalized people uh, within those communities have the least access to the technology that they need. I would say you've already, identifying it as a problem is the first step and it's the first critical step that I think a lot of organizations, uh, when they're thinking about their interventions, uh, miss. No, thank you for that. And that's something where, you know, obviously we look at gender and those metrics on every Orbis project, and that is built in at the beginning before a program or project is rolled out or even started. So that is baked into the design and the construct of a program before we start field implementation or working with partners. And certainly I think you started this uh, webinar talking about some of the uh, social issues that are coming to surface during a COVID crisis. On the different or a flip side of the coin, what are some innovations and some things that you see being created during this crisis that give you optimism and already are bringing utility to this very important field? One of the things that I'm most excited about is what we call in the development community, the localization agenda. And the localization agenda is a fancy way of saying having local people drive solutions for their communities. And intuitively, we all know that this is best because in our own communities, I'm in Peterborough, I'm in a small, a small town, I don't really want someone in a big city making decisions about, and we've seen this in COVID for sure, about what happens at my local school. I want that decision to be delegated to my local school authority so that I can have influence. Um, and I think when it comes to organizations like ours who are working overseas, we've, you know, in order to kind of protect donor dollars and, and demonstrate impact, we have often had the, the flip side impact of taking agency away from um, local actors. So rather than spending the resources to, to train and to which I know you guys actually do a great job of this. And so this is not a, not a, doesn't apply to you in the same way, but a lot of organizations, rather than train that doctor, train that nurse, train that educator in the whatever healthcare intervention, you know, they send, traditionally would send people over from the global north. COVID, uh, with its travel restrictions and inability to move about in the same way, will force a bit of a reckoning on this, right? Where we need to pass on, um, which we should have done a long time ago, through innovative technologies like the work that you're doing with educating people online, through that kind of thing, that, that capacity then gets built into communities and allows them to continue the work, whether you're there or not. And I think to me, we need to continue to get the resources to communities so they can do, do the work they need to do and buy the equipment they need. But 
the more that localization process happens, and I think COVID is forcing it a little bit, the better. So I think that's an exciting flip side. In Canada, we've also seen, and I I feel like globally to an extent, our major healthcare leaders are predominantly women. And so they reflect the fact that uh, in Canada, it's 84% of frontline healthcare workers are also women. But at the top, the people that we're seeing on, on the local media, on TV, are tending to be women. And I think you're seeing that in a lot of different jurisdictions. We're talking about politically how countries with women as leaders are doing faring better. Uh, The UN just put out a a study on that. They're faring better when it comes to COVID. So I do think that's a a, a bit of a, you know, I'm taking a bit of a side view to that to say, what's the long-term impact of seeing these powerful expert women uh, driving some of this conversation around how to address COVID. And we haven't, historically, we just haven't had the pipeline uh, to have those people on the TV screen. So I'm excited about that. I'm definitely seeing that trend in Canada and, and globally as well. You see with the World Health Organization, with others, you see just a lot of women taking predominant roles as experts. And what does that mean when it trickles all the way down to our, our young girls and children and their aspirations for what they want to do? So those are the two big opportunities I see. No, I, I, I love that. And, and Bolgan, obviously, you're a global citizen, you know, living in Canada, having been raised in Mongolia, and that's how you came to find out about Orbis. What are you hearing today that really resonates? And as we specifically look at you know, Mongolia, where I, I was supposed to be right now, I'm supposed to be in Mongolia if we didn't have the pandemic. What kind of things that Julie has been describing do you think really resonate with your home country, but also the Orbis work that we're doing there? Orbis has a very specific uh, mission in the global health, which is blindness and eye care. And I mean, it's not in the highest priority for global health these days, right? But it's, it's one of the crucial and one of the most important. And that also goes to the educational part where, you know, the kids, especially girls, if they can't see, they're not going to be better student. And it, it just leads to different results after that. Really, really serious issue when like small kids, like babies, when they're, you know, just born, if they just you know, miss that window, they're permanently blind, you know, they have whole life ahead of them. And it's just these things, when you think about it, it's just so difficult. But I think that um, organizations like Orbis, they're doing everything they can to train these doctors in the rural communities where these doctors can go and help their communities. You've raised something so interesting to me, because even if I think about, I just went for an eye exam for the first time in forever. And um, even in our, our healthcare, it's often thought of as a, a love to have. So it's not an expect, it's not a basic expectation of, of healthcare, at least in Canada and certainly globally. It's like, well, you know, we, you know, vaccine or this thing or food or, but th- this is the thing about healthcare interventions. Like you can't, you can't prioritize in some way because like you're saying as a young young child if you can't see that's it like that your your educational yeah. prospects are reduced as a, you know all all the points you made even in these difficult times it's it's important to keep in providing those care for those people who need those emergency care because the window is so uh, short and the uh, help needs to be, you know, provided as as quickly as possible. I want to ask Julia one question. If there's one thing you would like either for me or the audience that is listening and watching, if there is one takeaway that you'd like people to think about, you know, before you, you know, design a program or invest in an organization with time, money, or expertise, what is one thing you'd have the, or challenge the group to think about when addressing issues of gender, uh, and especially the healthcare sector, which we work in at at Orbis. One takeaway uh, that I'd like to promote, whether you're designing a program, whether you're investing in organization, is just put on that gender, those gender lens glasses, pay attention to how these projects and interventions could disproportionately affect women and girls and boys and men just think about it and just 
asking yourself that question can change the world. And I really believe that and have a lot of, have a lot of hope in the possibility of, of women to change the world and, you know, to play those leadership roles. But yeah, I think the one takeaway is just put on those glasses, think about it, make it a lens that you always look through. Um, and that alone will shift what you do, where you invest, and um, how you support the great work that Orbis and other organizations do. Thank you, Julia, for joining this episode of Sightlines. The discussions we had is just very important. And thank you for sharing those. Thank you so much. Thanks for having me. It was a pleasure. That was Julia Anderson. Our next guest is Dr. Susanna Bell, a clinical research fellow at the Moorfields Eye Hospital NHS Foundation Trust in the UK. Susanna, thank you so much for being with us today. And certainly you're doing incredible work in pediatric ophthalmology and you've really focused on pediatric cataracts, both from a global perspective and also from a genetic perspective. And thank you so much for having me. I'm very happy to be here and lovely to meet you both. Yes. And tell us a little bit about the work you're leading, what, what you've done so far in the field, and also what you're finding both in genetics and in global ophthalmology with access and gender issues. Um, well, currently I'm a clinical research fellow working at Moorfields Eye Hospital um, in a lab team led by Professor Maria Mushji. I'm actually a junior doctor, as you said, and I've taken some time out to do some eye-related research because I'm very passionate about it. Um, and Moorfields, um, it's a very exciting place to work and unique in that we have a partnership with the UCL Institute of Ophthalmology, which is right next door. My research at the moment is looking at the genetics of patients with congenital and juvenile cataracts and also a rare metabolic condition called cerebrotendinous anthematosis, which I'm sorry is a bit of a mouthful, um, which is a life-limiting but very treatable um, disease of which cataracts an early feature. Um, so really the overarching goal of the project is to improve the genetic investigation and management of children and um, with cataracts because in over half of um, bilateral cases a genetic cause can be found. But previously, I've done some work um, as part of my uh, master's that I did at the London School of Hygiene um, in Nepal. And then after that, I was um, helping with a national eye survey in the Gambia. Uh, very excited to have you here, Susanna. Can you tell us uh, a little bit more about your recent project in Nepal, where you were looking at uh, gender inequity uh, in uh, accessing eye care? Actually, this was um, a project looking at the reasons why carers might delay seeking treatment for their child with uh, bilateral cataracts, that's cataract in both eyes. And you're saying care, Susanna. In some countries, the word is caregiver. I just want to clarify that for our listeners from all over the world. Yes, and we know that uh, there is a problem with um, carers delaying seeking treatment, but we don't really know why. So what we did was... Um, give 102 carers a questionnaire to fill in. And then we held in-depth interviews and focus group discussions. And some of the key things that we found that are relevant to, to this discussion um, were that carers uh, spend nearly two months of their household expenditure on accessing care for their child. And so it was no surprise that 40% stated that cost was the main barrier to uh, accessing surgery for them. And we also asked, um, when did you first notice a problem with your child's vision? And from that, we measured the time from when carers had first noticed a problem to presenting at the um, hospital for surgery. And we found that this time was statistically longer um, for female children than it was for male children, by 182 days. And also, and this has already been found at this hospital um, in Eastern Nepal, um, was that only 34% of the children in our study were female, um, despite cataracts affecting the sexes equally. Um, so yeah, some really interesting um, findings um, and sort of uh, maybe suggesting some reasons why there is a gender disparity in that, um, you know, if you're having to spend two months household expenditure to access care, and perhaps you're living in an area where male children may be more um, economically valuable, um, very poor families are going to be forced to make these um, very difficult gendered financial decisions. Susanna, you know, I, and I really appreciate, you know, the fact that you were in Nepal working with these families, because yeah. we all know it takes a village for a child to get their eyesight. Could you just talk very briefly about how a pediatric cataract, a child's cataract, may be different than an adult? Pediatric cataract um, intervention is different from adult um, cataract surgery because um, 
when children have cataract, often it develops within um, a period where the vision is still developing, the visual pathway from um, the eye to the brain. And so really you need a good unobstructed path of light um, entering the eye and reaching the back of the, the eye, the retina, um, to consistently during childhood to um, get um, very good um, visual development. And so if you have um, something blocking that in the way, so clouding of the lens, which is what a cataract is, um, this isn't possible. And so um, the visual development um, will be interrupted. And um, even after the cataract is removed many years later, this child may still have um, visual impairment or may be blind because their visual pathway has not developed properly. Yes, and I think everyone probably heard in their, their life and may know a family member or someone during their school years who had a patch over their eye for lazy eye. And I think that's what you're talking about, where those critical years where the, the eye needs to get very focused light and pictures to the back of the eye, if that's interrupted, that lazy eye or those pathways will never develop, even if you correct it years later. So really the work you're doing is time sensitive and critical to the development of that child's eye, as well as their educational development and their social development. Can you tell us a little bit more about the research on the economic factor? Why it, the reason for girls having, you know, less access to the eye care than, for example, boys? I should probably start with saying that obviously I'm a British woman um, from the UK talking about a uh, Nepali uh, female experience, which obviously I'll, I'll never fully understand. Um, so I'll stick to commenting on the findings of um, this study, which were in uh, uh, rural eastern Nepal um, in a hospital called Sagamatha Chowdhury Eye Hospital. Um, which is a really, really busy hospital. They do, I think in the year before we did the study, had done um, 700, over 700 pediatric cataract operations that year. Um, so very busy. For me, the most interesting finding was this mother who was expressing real concern about her son's vision, who um, may perhaps potentially um, be the one that would have to work in the family as she couldn't work. In fact, she also had bilateral cataracts herself, she was led into the interview by her son who also had bilateral cataracts. And then obviously the, in, in that culture, the female um, child um, will grow up, get married and then leave the family. Um, so, and the male child will stay within the family and help support the family. If you're a very, very poor family, you are going to struggle um, if your only son is visually impaired because it, this will reduce his access to work, um, education. What is something you'd like our audience to know about the importance of you know, gender and how Orbis can do more of this incorporation at the beginning of our program planning, whether it's in pediatrics or even adult eye care? I think it's really hard to um, talk about gender inequality without talking about health inequity in general in eye care. And someone who does a lot of research on this is, called, is a woman called Jacqueline Ramke from the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine. Um, and she found that um, in populations with high cataract blindness, um, the more socially disadvantaged groups um, include women, rural dwellers and those who are not literate, um, but also um, that these groups aren't independent of each other. Um, and the, the group that was really in most need um, were illiterate rural women. And so I think when we're talking about um, gender disparity in eye care, we really need to be keeping this group of people in mind when we're um, planning services and projects. Yes, and I think the other thing you've talked about, like the vicious cycle of poverty and blindness and gender. Can you talk about how cataract surgery can reverse that and what some of the best stories you have from your, your time in Nepal? Yes. So, I mean, for example, um, if you are a female child, for example, with, who's born with um, bilateral cataracts and um, you don't receive any treatment or you have a delay in treatment, um, and you are visually impaired or blind from this, and this obviously is going to affect your access to education. Um, and we know that um, female education not only benefits the individual, but also benefits the community around them and future generations. For example, we know improving the education of girls and um, reduces um, neonatal deaths. And so in that way, it benefits the whole community and um, the next generation. 
Absolutely. And that's one of the things we have a project called REACH, Refractive Error Amongst Children, that works both in India and Nepal. So I know those are the two communities you're most familiar with from your research. We've screened millions of children, and obviously we find that white pupil, the leukocoria that could be a cataract or other serious disease. And that's something that we found is that education and vision are incredibly intertwined. And the earlier you get sight, the better your educational trajectory are. How do you think COVID is going to impact these referrals, networks, and pediatric care? The whole world has been adjusting to a new sort of way of working and living. And um, I know many projects have been delayed. And a lot of focus has shifted quite rightly onto um, tackling COVID-19. And so really what we need to do is just make sure that we are keeping the focus on issues of gender um, equality in eye care to make sure these aren't left unaddressed. Also, with the sort of shift towards more remote working and telemedicine rather than face-to-face consultations and interventions in person, we may be able to access more um, rural populations and the populations that are in the most need through telemedicine. So I think we're going to see a big um, shift in that way. Yeah, just to add on that, uh, back home in Mongolia, doctors who are in the rural areas, they, you know, when they need help, with the diagnosis, with the surgeries, they're using telemedicine, the uh, cybersite uh, platform to get the consultation from the doctors. And I think this is unbelievable. And uh, there are certain advantages of, of uh, COVID that, you know, really pushing uh, to use the telemedicine to the fullest. And Bolgan, you'll be very happy to hear on cybersite. Mongolia has adopted the platform more than any other country. And after English, Mongolian is the second most common language. So it really makes me happy we can join in and the Flying Eye Hospital team while they're grounded during COVID is actually partnering with the Ophthalmic Society in Mongolia to do the entire conference and do lectures and training on CyberSight. A few days ago, I checked a lecture. It was about a tear duct surgery and it was surreal to see a Mongolian doctor teaching other doctors about the case that was just not available when I had the issue. So I, I was sharing this, you know, the link with everyone I know who knows my case, and it was just magical moment. So, um, yeah, thank you for bringing, um, talking about that cyber side courses in Mongolian. And I think it also helps when they're teaching in native language. And I think it's very important so that all the doctors have access to these courses. So thank you for doing this. Just to go back to the Nepal project and ask about the people, is there like any beneficiary story that left an impression on you? I mean, there were so many, um, to be honest. Um, I think the the most inspiring one for me, and obviously, but also the the biggest limitation of the study, because it was based at a um, an eye hospital. Obviously, we're not reaching those p- uh, carers who had not access care at all. So, I think the the story that really was. Um, the the most amazing was this woman who um, I think a member of her community had told her that uh, something uh, that this would go away on its own or that um, it was something that should this is something that her child was affected because uh, something bad she'd done in the previous life or something and then she'd managed to see a doctor but the doctor and the doctor had correctly identified a cataract but then she couldn't afford surgery and then there were just all these barriers and then finally this buff bus um this cataract um, outreach service arrived and this really um allowed her child to ha- access care and so really for me that was the sort of standout um um story for me yeah thank you for sharing that maybe i know you've talked about more fields for those who don't know can you tell us about this incredible eye center it's been an academic partner for orbis for years some of our best volunteer faculty including in pediatrics comes from this hospital it's a very exciting place to be because you do have such a mix of experts um in a very sort of close space. Really, it's just exciting to share um, information and knowledge um, with each other. I'm just very excited to be involved with organisations that are willing to discuss these really complex issues and also to be part of the solution. Both the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine and the International Centre for Eye Health there and Moorfields are very committed to reducing the health inequities globally and also willing to discuss gender inequality in ophthalmology 
psychology, not just in um, patient access to care, but also within um, the workspace and Women in Vision UK, which is a great resource for women in ophthalmology. And um, so, sorry, if you are a, a woman in ophthalmology who uh, would like to get involved, um, I'm sure you can Google them, but they also have Twitter and um, Instagram. We really appreciate not only you spending time with us today, but really the work, the hours you spent away from family and friends doing this really critical field work. If there was one thing you would like for our audience to take away from your work, from your observations, from your experience with regards to gender and blindness and how women are changing the way the world sees, what would be that one takeaway that you want all of our viewers and listeners to, to know and, and, and follow? I think really... And um, being aware of the issue and not being afraid to discuss these issues um, and really um, thinking about them more and um, talking about them. And because I think the more that we talk about them, um, the more we could, that's sort of really the first step to making a change to addressing this issue. <laughs> Yeah, and I think that's something we're, we're deeply committed to at Orbis. I think we know that this is a critical part of the, the problem. And blindness is not just the eye. It's, it's the person connected to the eye, how they fit into their family, the community, what cultural or government or other social influences are impacting that pediatric cataract or adult cataract. So yes, I, I think that's the point of the sight lines is educating people of the non-ophthalmic components of blindness. And I just can't thank you enough for your field work your time today. And I'm super excited to see where you go with your career, both geographically and clinically, because I, I can just tell you're going to do amazing things. Well, thank you very much. And thank you so much for having me. I'm completely honoured. And so lovely to meet you as well, Volcan. Thank you. Same here. Thank you so much. That was Dr. Susanna Bell. I want to thank all of our guests today on Sightlines, and a special thanks to my friend and co-host, Bolgan Ordelsagen. We've been talking about women changing the world, predominantly from an eye care perspective, but it's about so much more. Women lift economies, empowering them, creating access to education and healthcare, that translates into richer leadership, stronger communities, and healthier societies, and a changed world for the better. Orbis's commitment to ensuring that they can see their future will remain one of our greatest priorities. Thank you for joining me for Sightlines today. I hope you'll join us for the next episode and for the entire series. If you'd like to learn more about Orbis and the Flying Eye Hospital, please visit us at orbis.org. If you enjoyed this show, please subscribe to our YouTube channel to watch each episode and check out many other videos about our work around the globe. If you're listening to the podcast version of the show, please hit subscribe so you don't miss a future episode. And if you're listening in an Apple podcast, please consider rating or reviewing the show. It really does help others learn about us, about Orbis, and our sight-saving mission. Until next time. <laughs>